drug overdose deaths soared to over 93,000 in 2020. That's a 30% increase over the previous year. That's tragic and alarming. But beyond the statistics are the stories of real people, people we love, our families, our friends, our neighbors, who share their stories of pain, grief, and loss and suffering through addiction as well as the stories of those who work tirelessly to combat this devastating epidemic. I'm Mike Torville. Join me now for Healing Voices Project. Welcome back, everyone, to Healing Voices Project, where we share stories of addiction, grief, recovery, and courage. You know, this is our sixth episode, and we're just starting to get our stride here. And uh, I got to tell you, um, what I really have been impressed with is some of our guests, guests that share stories, guests that work in the field of addiction, substance abuse, people that share their passion for their work. And it's really motivated me to keep this thing going. So I just want to say thank you to the guests that we've had so far and to the guests we have today, uh, Senator John Velas. And speaking of passion for work, um, when I have got to know John some months ago, I could see that loud and clear, <laughs> your passion for your work in several ways um, through substance abuse in particular, because that's how we got to know each other through this. So uh, welcome, John. Thanks for coming. I appreciate the uh, good morning. I appreciate the invite. Yeah. Such a such a critical topic. So I appreciate you doing this, and uh, thanks for allowing me to come on. Sure. Well, I'm glad to have you. And you know, I, I've said this before in some of our episodes that, uh, in, in fact, each episode we dedicated to somebody that we lost through addiction, and we've asked if you would like to donate to a charity or organization in their honor. Today we're going to do something a little different. Okay. Um, Today, we're going to dedicate this episode to the veterans, the veterans we've lost, particularly through substance abuse, the veterans that affect us all because there's so many families that know of people. Um, My dad was a veteran. John, you're a veteran. And I think that uh, particularly with the veterans that have gone through all kinds of issues and challenges that often lead to substance abuse. So in their honor, we're asking if you'd like to donate to the Springfield Vet Center, and that can be found at va.gov, and look for the Springfield Vet Center, which is located in West Springfield. So we'll uh, dive right in with John, and uh, before we start our conversation, I'll just tell a little bit about you, uh, if you don't know John. First, you've been a state senator for about a year and a half, yeah. and in that short time, you've gone through two elections. Thanks for reminding me. Yes. <laughs> so in May of 2020, I think we had a special election. Yeah. And uh, six months later, in November, you got reelected. That's great. Glad to have you here and reelected. And you may have another election uh, in another year. Yeah, we'll definitely have an election. Uh, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> yeah. definitely have an election a year from November. The time goes. Yeah. It, like that, right? It's just, you know, yeah. my, one of the things that's yeah. not lost on me, and it's been really interesting, is that I've been... I've only been a state senator, you know, during COVID-19. And one of the things is my colleagues, I've said this a bunch of times, but for whatever reason, they refer to me, I think affectionately, as the COVID senator. Um, (laughs) Because I've I've only been in since COVID, which obviously presents so many um, interesting challenges and complexities to the job. Because a big part of this is getting out into the community. Yeah, I'm counting on you emerging from that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So in more ways than one. I I strive to shed that nickname. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is I know you're um, part of several committees, and, and you've got five or six committees you sit on, but more importantly, you are the chair of the Joint Committee on Veterans and Federal Affairs, a vice chair of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Abuse, and Recovery, which we'll be talking about quite a bit, and also the vice chair of the Joint Committee on Children, Families, and Persons with Disabilities. You're a busy guy, hard to keep up with. Yeah, and, those, <laughs> and what's really fascinating about that from, a, from just a intellectual curiosity standpoint is that so many of those issues yeah. that I'm involved in right now are kind of at the forefront. You know, a lot of these issues, particularly what we're talking about today, yeah. substance use disorders, mental illness, they've really been brought to the forefront with COVID. They've, COVID has exacerbated things that have been going on long before that. Um, so it's just critical, critical, critical 
committees and critical work right now that we're doing. So I'm just fortunate to be a part of it. Yep. And also, too, you were recently selected to join an opiate policy fellowship where you were selected as one of 20 lawmakers across the country. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So at the beginning of the session, every every two years, the National Council of State Legislators kind of puts this, it's this opiate policy fellowship program. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they solicit uh, invitations to apply for this of lawmakers who have demonstrated some type of interest on this issue. Um, the Senate president, you know, was very fortunate to have her put me forward. And it's just uh, the thought process behind it is, look, Massachusetts could be doing something that's interesting. Florida could be doing something that's interesting. Pennsylvania, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why not everybody get together? In a lot of instances in all legislation, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, something could be going on in a different place that we're not doing here. And it, when it comes to this topic where people literally are dying on a daily basis, it's a good thing. So I'm honored to be there. And you can learn from other successes, obviously. Oh, no, absolutely. Why, why operate separately when you can, yeah. <clears throat> One of the one of the things that I've really come to appreciate is that, and I think, and we can, we'll obviously talk about this, but we need to do a much better job when it comes to substance use disorder of kind of integrating everything. There's these separate silos that exist right now, and we treat we treat individuals based on a lot of times, you know, what they're presenting with. So if it's a if it's a substance use issue, um, we'll treat the substance use issue, but we don't talk to them about. You know, maybe there's some mental illness going on. Maybe they were a veteran who was exposed to something very traumatic. Maybe housing's an issue. We need to do much better of kind of integrating that care because until you treat the whole of that person, um, in my experience anyway, you're going to have a real difficult time treating that person at all. And speaking of your experience, I think you can talk about this first thing because you're uh, currently you're a major in the Army. Yeah. You've been uh, since, since 2011? 2010. 2010. Yeah, 2010. So yeah. uh, time goes. And you did serve in Afghanistan. Yeah, I had two tours, 12, 13, and 18. Yeah. 12 to 13, and then 2018. So you can certainly speak from that experience. And from what you've seen uh, through your own experience yeah. and through others, you can talk a little bit about what you've seen there. You know, what? one of the things that I think is happening here, and if you look at, again, mental illness, substance use disorders across the board, you're seeing that the veteran, as, as hard as the world has been hit in terms of addiction, in terms of some of these issues that we're seeing out there. You see increased numbers with the veteran population. Um, and you could point to any number of reasons, but one of them, I think anyway, in my experience, is that a lot of times service members, veterans, have been exposed to certain things overseas. Um, and it could result in something like post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, well, not for whatever reason, I, I know the reason they self-medicate, um, and and I get it. I understand it. I appreciate it. So, so our job is those of us who are lucky enough to be what I would call policymakers on some level, is to kind of meet these veterans where they are, and and try to get to them the help where they are. Because that, if I if I've learned anything about addiction and recovery, it's that you know in many instances you need to meet the individual where they are. Um, any number of instances exist and we could talk about you know we could fill this entire hour talking about service members who anybody who who expressed an interest in kind of trying to turn their life around and get clean and sober on a monday help wasn't available to them on monday so they went back out um, and they died on tuesday or and that happens all the time so getting those services available when the individual in question is ready for those services um, is absolutely paramount. And that's what you mean by meet them where they are. Absolutely. Right at the very moment you can. Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that I would think it affects besides the, the, the multiple deployments, PTSD, is the separation, separation from their families. That's a big, big thing. Also, what's affected everybody during COVID as well. So. It, yeah, I mean, just uh, we're human beings, right. right? This is therapeutic, just talking right. to each other. Yeah. Um, so if you if you take somebody away from their family, and then you put them into a, a, a very violent situation um, where they're dealing with these stressors from what they're being exposed to, coupled with the fact that their family and their loved ones back here in the in the rear in the states. Um, it makes for a very difficult situation, and it's why, and, and I think the military's done a really good job adjusting and realizing that, you know, mental health is not something to be 
I'll say behavioral health, so I cover, cover both mental illness as well as substance use disorder, it's not something that we should be shutting our service members for. You know, it's not, it's not weak to raise your hand and say, hey, I need help. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a time, very, very candidly, as someone who is unabashedly pro-military and myself, I have no problems in reservation saying that there was a time when raising your hand and saying, I need help, could be perceived as a sign of weakness. And as a result, you know, we lost people. I, I would think there's been some progress with that, Absolutely. but not enough, because I think there's still that, that, that machoism that I don't want to be perceived as being weak. I don't want to be perceived as having a problem. So they just kind of grind it out, don't want to admit there's a problem, and, and that uh, exacerbates the problem. You know, that's a hundredfold. Yeah. Um, you know, part of the process, too, is, um, you know, we fill out certain papers, we'll say, and a lot of it's tied to security clearances and stuff like that. And many of those questions are tied to, you know, have you spoken to anybody about, you know, anything going on in your life? Have you spoken to a therapist? Um, talk to me about your, your, your use of alcohol, drugs. Um, and, and a lot of times those questions, if they're not answered, you know, the right way, the, the right way. Um, you could find yourself being forced to talk to someone and you could find yourself, A, having a security clearance held up, um, which could obviously impact your career. Many jobs in the military, if you don't have a clearance, you're gone. Um, and it just causes, again, those for someone who's, who's struggling, it causes additional stressors. It causes more things, you know, more static in the attic, as we say, in your mind. And it just puts people in a bad place. But again, always try to be someone that's tries to be you know glass half full the military is definitely getting better okay so in your 11 years or so yeah. almost 12 you've you've seen a lot of changes you've yeah. seen some progress and changes that make a difference now yeah I, I've been involved with people that have kind of come forward and admitted to you know alcoholism admitted to substance use stuff I mean it's 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 widely known, you know, myself, right, as someone who's who's in recovery for alcoholism, is recovering alcoholic. Um, it's a it's a fact of life. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fact of life, and you know, yeah, we've gotten better, but we need to strive to do far better because the way the way that I look at it is that, you know, we send our we need a we need to pause and think for a second. If you if you think about America right now, less than one half of one percent of their country is serving in the military. Um, I, I, we're not here to talk about the, the geopolitical challenges facing America right now, but let's just suffice it to say there are many. And that less than one half of 1%, we should be treating as if they are royalty because the, the world we live in, the violent world we live in, if you're not going to have a draft, if you're going to continue to have kind of this gulf between the civilian world and the military, and it's a gulf that continues to grow, which again is a whole nother story. But we kind of live in a world today, and I think I'll quote former President Bush, uh, President Bush 43, not 41. He said, you know, the army was at war, but America was at Walmart. You know, these wars went on, Afghanistan, Iraq in particular, and life back here in the States kind of just proceeded as if it was just another day. And we're, we're very fortunate in that regard. You know, the, the wars aren't happening here. Right. And there's a tendency to forget what's going on. You know, it's just a, you know, initially when the war started, it was the main news, whatever news station you watch. But as the years went on, the years went on, slowly but surely those, those, those wars kind of faded. You know, they became the forgotten wars. Mm -hmm. um, but for the less than one half of 1% that were fighting those wars and their families and their loved ones, they were not forgotten wars. They were, they were front and center. Over time, that, that happens too. People get desensitized, detached. It's a distance thing, and you're right. They just stop talking. And, and I'm about, not yeah. even. I'm not yeah. even. I'm, and I'm not even saying that in a negative way. That I think that's just human nature. It's natural. Right? It's natural. Yeah. You know, yeah. if, if something's not in front of you, and if it doesn't impact you, it's natural to kind of move on to the next thing. And it's not just the person serving; it's their families. You, you think about the, their families, their wives, children at home, waiting for them to come back, and when they come back, they may see some oh, some absolutely. changes and it's it's the whole family that sacrifices not just the veteran a, a, a million times over you know i, I it, i'll tell you a personal story for me and it was i was this was back in 2012 and i made a mistake of telling my family that i was going to be traveling you know whenever it was not obviously giving away where i'm going any of that stuff but just traffic traveling on a helicopter you know, in the next coming days, however I worded it. 
um, just just kind of passing news. And I was saying it in the context to my loved ones is that I'm not going to be able to talk to you for a week or so. I'm good. I'm just I'm just going somewhere where I can't talk uh, where I can't talk to you. And, and lo and behold, I, I, I get to this place and it was a, a small, small, small installation in a place called Shah Joy, Afghanistan, a small, small district in um, in Zabul province. And so I'm completely cut off from the world. And lo and behold, that those days, that time period, several Black Hawk helicopters went down just from weather. I think one might have been shot out of the sky. I, I don't remember. But several Black Hawks went down and several service members were killed. Um, so I get back to my installation, you know, a week later, whatever it was, a few days later on. And when I called home, um, it was just they, they were it, my entire family was just devastated because they didn't know if I was one of the service members who went down. I bring that story up just to your point that many service members, when they're over there, they're, they're focused on the mission, what they need to do. And the hearts of their loved ones back home are, are the ones that are torn over and over again. You get in your, you get in your battle, rhythm, battle rhythm over there as a service member, and you forget that you know, your loved ones are in pins and needles back home. Yeah, exactly. You know... It, Especially when you can't communicate, people are left in the dark. Oh, yeah. uh, my son Nick served in Iraq. Uh, he, in fact, he, he similar um, background as yourself because he went to Northeastern for political science, and he was all geared up to get into politics. He worked. He worked for Mike Kanapik actually for a while. <laughs> Talked about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. A dear friend of mine, Mike Kanapik. Yes, <laughs> he is. He's a great guy. Uh, and Nick worked out of the state house for a while, and and he just looked at this closely and said, "You know what? I have I have other plans." So he he ended up joining the navy. He went to Iraq, and he served at uh, one of the bases that the former one of Saddam's yeah. former palaces that would turn into a base. I said, Nick, are you going to be all right? He goes, oh, yeah, 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 Dad, this is safe. I'm in a great spot. I'm safe, safe. Don't give it a second thought. Well, of course I gave it a second. Of course. of course it was on pins and needles, but he assured me he was fine. And um, it was – he didn't share with me the whole truth. No. Um, it was only – actually, it wasn't months. It was years. A couple of years later, he said that, uh, in fact, they were bombed. He did lose some friends. Uh and I didn't know it at the time. I'm almost glad he didn't share that yeah. with me because that would have been a mess. Um, but that's not uncommon. You know? Yeah, um, I, yeah, 100%. And that's, you know, obviously thanking your boy for a service. Um, again, that that anybody who steps up is just, uh, quite frankly, they're, they're kind of my heroes, you know, in this, in this, in this day and age. Um, same, v very similar situation. I, I didn't have the... Um, so I, I was involved in something back in 2013, April 6, 2013, to be specific, where it kind of made, um, long story short, service members were killed, but also a foreign service officer, um, a young lady named Ann Smettinghoff, was, was also killed. It was, a, it was a foot patrol to deliver books um, not far from where our, 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 our base was, a place called Fob Smart, and these, um, I'll just refer to them as insurgents they um they they, they basically put a, a car bomb into a formation and then they were able to put a, a a bomb up to our base but anyway um three u.s service members of many other people died as well but it became very big news because Anne, god rest her soul was the first and i believe only foreign service officer in afghanistan to be killed um and just you know coming to research about her and um just find out about her just a just a beautiful human being from the Chicago area that, that you know, just, just a, a senseless loss of life. Um, and it was just a, it was a, it was a tough couple of days. But kind of going back to what we were talking about, you know, they, when the news reports started to kind of come up about what happened and where it happened, um, you know, certainly my parents, uh, my then girlfriend knew that that's, that's, that's exactly where I was. Um, so it was just, uh, it's interesting. Again, getting back to the point of, yeah, the family members are uh, where it's at with this stuff. Very affected by this more than, you know. So I think the, the work that you're doing on the uh, – in each of these committees that you're on, they seem to overlap. When you talk about mental health, substance abuse, children, families, mm -hmm. and veterans, it all Absolutely. blends together. 
A lot of intersectionality, if you will. A lot That's of crossover. A good word, yeah. <laughs> I just learned that word. I said bland, <laughs> you said intersectionality. <laughs> I'm actually stealing that from somebody else, so do not give that credit to me, viewers. Um, but some of the work you've done, uh, particularly in the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Abuse, and Recovery, what, what's can you share some of the work you've done and what's happening with that in particular? Yeah, so so one of the things that I'm kind of doing right now, and it's kind of a, it's kind of an overlap between the the committee, but also the fellowship that we talked about, is I've kind of, you know, taken upon myself with with my staff to, I want to know who the, the 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 leaders in thought are, not only here in Massachusetts but beyond. So I've got done everything from. You know, Colorado's got some really interesting things going on. So the doctor that's kind of leading the charge out there, I had the most fascinating meeting with um, with this doctor. And recently, I was at Mass General Hospital in uh, in, in here in Massachusetts, obviously a very revered hospital on the world stage. And this doctor, her name is Sarah Wakeman, and many people would argue that Doctor Wakeman is one of the foremost, if not the foremost, authority on substance use disorders and I and I just had a real fascinating interaction with her and her team out there and it's kind of where they're at right now is in what I by the way what I was saying earlier about that integration of care that's really the model that I'm talking about that I saw at Mass General Bay State's doing some of it here but in essence what their hypothesis is is that we live in the society today again where there's these separate silos we need to move into when I say integrated healthcare, let me just kind of get a little more specific about that. So someone presents to their PCP for an annual physical. Mm -hmm. Doctor sees, hey, you know, we'll just pick on me. Uh, not pick on me. We'll talk about me because substance use disorder is not something to be picked on about. Um, you know, I've got maybe, maybe track marks on my arm. Maybe I've got, you know, the signs of someone who's in the throes of addiction. Well, doctor asks you a question, you know, takes your blood pressure you know, just, you know, knocks on your knees, does whatever they do at their annual physical, and then could send you on their way. We need to get to a place where that doctor is co-located with some type of person who's an addiction specialist in that office. So that person can then go in there and talk to John Vilas about, hey, what's going on? I, you know, I see clear signs of addiction. We need to integrate that more as opposed to all these separate things. Because if you, if, if I go to get my physical, and um, I just get my physical and, and nothing more, even though that doctor suspects, in, in fact, in their professional opinion, knows yeah. that I'm abusing some type of, um, you know, substance. Um, I leave that door, you know, I may not be coming back. So we have a situation, we have a scenario, we have a, a current environment where it's okay. Hey, you, um, it looks like you might be, you know, abusing narcotics, we'll say. You know, you should take this card and call such and such. Well, if I'm in the throes of addiction, the chances of me taking that card and calling such and such just aren't there. Um, and, and I guess I'll get personal for a second. You know, one of the things that I've come to really appreciate is that, you know, substance use, whether it's alcohol, whether it's heroin, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's methamphetamine, you know, it, it, it's a symptom of something much larger going on. And, you know, if, 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 if we remove that substance from that person's life, whatever it may be, there's still a lot going, all you've done is taken away the symptom. Yep. You, you need to treat, it's like we have a set expression in the army, you know, if you can put, you know, a tourniquet's not gonna stop internal bleeding. We need to get at the internal bleeding. And if you, if you then have that scenario set up where you say, hey John, what's going on? Is it, you know, housing? Like for example, there's a lot of empirical evidence showing that if someone doesn't have proper housing, whatever that may be, um, consistent housing, you got to treat that before you can treat the substance use. You, you have to address the root cause of it. Root causes. Otherwise, it just perpetuates. And, perpetuates. Yeah. So that's that's again that's that integrated level of care that that Mass General is really leading from. Where it's hey, okay, so you've got you know you've got untreated depression. You know you're presenting here as someone who is you know injecting heroin every day. Let's talk. What's going on? huh, you've got depression, you know, you're not going anywhere. We're going to talk to you over here. We're going to have you talk to our, you know, clinical psychiatrist about that depression and treat that. Hey, where do you live? Oh, you're at Mass and Cass in Boston, you know, the area that everybody's talking about right now. Let's go talk to this person about housing. 
and then so on and so forth. So you're treating the whole of the person as opposed to just one thing going on in their life. Right, right. Well, <clears throat> if someone, and you know, if you have people who are um, ready to help at the moment, and you brought that up earlier, where they are right at the moment. Yeah. But if you're a person, go, person going through addiction, you know you need help, and you're not at that moment, what, where would, where would somebody start? Where would they call and say, you know what, I, I have to talk with somebody? It's, and it depends on where they are, of course. But uh, what would you suggest for somebody who just is at their wit's end without, and maybe they're separated from their family. Maybe they're, um, what's the initial call they make? It's a great question, and it's a and it's a very frustrating question for me as someone who's you know I've got a foot in both doors, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a policy maker who, who who is who is also in recovery. So I constantly have this, what are we doing mindset? And and I would be remiss if I didn't say that you know one of the things that I've come to appreciate with the fellowship is you know Massachusetts. We've actually done a lot of things where we are at the forefront. So what, one of the things this Opiate Policy Fellowship is, they, they love getting folks from Massachusetts on there because we have done, we've passed some pretty interesting legislation. Um, I, I guess the one thing that I would say is that, you know, I was, I, I was on the phone with a buddy of mine on the way over here, and, and he, he has spent the past 15 years, I'd say about 20 years, um, addicted to a combination of heroin and crack cocaine. Um, he's now approaching two months of sobriety. And I said, and I told him, I said, hey, I'm going on to a, 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 a however I described this, you know, I'm, go, I'm going to talk about this um, in Aguam. And it's, you know, what would you say? What would be one thing that you would say to somebody who, who has just struggled over and over again, yeah. has relapsed over and over again? And he goes, look, he goes, the most important thing is that the, and this is something that I swear by as well, um, the, the individual in question. He said that you have to admit, you know, and he was kind of, he has chosen a path, and I want to be very clear here, there are multiple paths to recovery. He has chosen this time around to engage in, you know, one of the 12-step programs. Um, and, 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 and he said that, you know, you know the, f the first step in the 12 steps is that admitting you're powerless you know, admitting you're powerless, whether it's alcohol, whether it's substance use, and it's, and it's longer than that, but it's, you know, powerless in your life becoming unmanageable. But, but what he said was that until the individual in question admits and really fully gets, like, knowing you're powerless, anyone can say, yeah, I'm not good with drinking or I'm not good with drugging, but then actually believing it and doing it something. He goes, until you admit that, there's just, there's just no chance at recovery. Um, because, and that's, and that's kind of my opinion on that. And I guess what I mean by that is that over and over again, and I'll, and I'll go back to me in this instance, um, you know, I, the number of times that I, I indicated that I wanted to get better with my drinking, mm -hmm. but didn't, um, you know, relapse after relapse, drinking after drinking, um, I've come to appreciate that no human being in this world is going to get better. And by better, I don't necessarily mean sober, abstinent, and all that stuff, because I want to be very clear here. My belief and my definition of recovery is whatever works for the individual in question, agree, whether, yeah. whether, it's, whether it's a 12-step program, whether it's medication-assisted treatment, whether it's therapy, whatever works Some for you. Some religious programs that work for people. Religious yes. programs. Just yep. fill in the blanks. Right. Fill in the blanks. Right. If it works for you, and it allows you to live a life, a fulfilling life. Hey, that's good recovery. That's, exactly. that, that's good recovery. Yeah. But but I do believe that whatever path to recovery you reach, the individual in question needs to make a decision themselves that that they want to get better. No matter what path it is, it always begins with the absolutely. admission that Abs absolutely. I have a problem. And you know who? And it's a scary thing. I would think to. Because there's something, even with yourself, you said, "All right, there's a time when I said, you know what, this is this is out of control. I have to talk to someone, admit it to someone, the right person, who, how, what's this go how's this going to affect my job, my family? Mm -hmm. That's All scary right. to people, and they say, you know what, uh, no, never mind, because they're 
it, it takes courage. No, it, it, it's, it's the, it's the most. I would argue it's the most courageous decision that a human being has to make in their life because it's it's not. It is literally a life or death situation. You know, in my experience, that people. You know, this Dr. Wakeman said something that really really fascinating. She said, in our experience empirically, people at some point in time will get better. And she was kind of indicating, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, that on some level they will grow out of it. The problem is that they're just dying. Yes. They're dying. So, you know, you could have a a 19-year-old, you know, who's in the throes of heroin addiction, and maybe when they're 25, they would get better. The problem is that what we're seeing out there, I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's almost a misnomer saying heroin right now because it's really fentanyl that's out there right mm-hmm. now. And people are just dropping left and right. And that, that young lady or that young man who's dead, again, would have gotten better at 26. Maybe they would have grown out of it, but they're just not alive to, to do that. Right. And I, you know, I have, unfortunately, several friends who've had their child die from heroin fentanyl and that's where it's just it, it's just too many and that just keeps happening and this is this is why we're, we're doing this. this is why you do the work you do because it's just getting out of control and sometimes just what they say one and done it doesn't even take months or years and give somebody a chance to survive it I got a good buddy um, his 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 brother is a buddy um, yeah. Who, who had who had a, a length of sobriety I would see him at various recovery things um, get, uh, went back out went back out one time um, found him under a bridge in Holyoke heroin laced with fentanyl um, and it's just that's how dangerous it is out there right now and it happens too if somebody stays away and it could be months yeah, or years goes down. and their body is intolerant and it, it just once and, and then they're done yeah so to answer your question, you know, I, w- I would, you know, some, if someone called me, right, and this is a uh, yeah. pretty frequent occurrence um, where, where, where someone will call me up and I guess I would say, yeah, I would want to talk to them, right? I would want to, you know, because a, a, a lot of people just need detox, which is whether it's booze, drugs, it's you need to detox. I mean, my, my layperson definition of detox is you're separating the substance from their body. That's all you're doing. That is not treatment. That is not doing anything other than taking that heroin, that alcohol out of your system. So now you have this individual who's out of detox, and it's, what do you do next? In my opinion, that is the most critical spot right there because on some level, you've got that person, he or she, in a, in a somewhat, somewhat lucid state. Um, be very clear here. Many of these substances take much longer, the impact they have on your brain, your body, and other things. But you're, I guess the better way to put that would be you're more lucid than you were before you went into detox. Absolutely critical at that point. So that that's where you kind of, you grab that person, you he or she, and you say, hey, what do, what do you want to do? What's A big part of that is, is this individual really ready? Are they ready at that point and do this? Or do they want to go back out? Because at the end of the day, if that person wants to go back out, they can. I mean, obviously, we have things like something called a Section 35. Mm-hmm. Um, and for, I guess for, for, for purposes of maybe your viewers, if they're not familiar with the Section 35, which is basically a family member, a loved one, certain qualified petitioners is the legal phrase to describe them, can basically go to a court and say that this person, my loved one, is a threat to themselves or others because of drugs or alcohol. Um, and, and that's just a whole nother rabbit hole of, you know, section 35s. That's a whole nother debate that's raging right now of does involuntary treatment work? Well, I would think with involuntary treatment in section 35, you're not typically going to get that kind of cooperation. You will get some resistance, which makes it even harder and may even cause some alienation with a family. You see that happening? Oh, it's, it's funny. I just, you know, the, the guy I was just talking to, my yeah. buddy, it was just a lot of times I'll ask people, you know, when I see him out, hey, tell me about what do you think about Section 35s? And they'll chuckle and they'll say, well, the first thing they'll say, they'll laugh and they'll say, well, what time? So it, it happens over and over again. But the one of the hardest things that, 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 that I've had to do is, and, and this is where I think the value of Section 35s can come in. 
Um, and I'm kind of right in the middle of that debate, you know, right in the middle of it, not meaning me, I'm important, meaning me is I see it both ways. You know, there are certain individuals that are out there um, that are so, essentially it's, you're going to die. You're going to die and you're going to die soon. Let's just, let's break in place. You know, I don't care. You are my loved one. You are my son. You are my daughter. I need to stop this process. I think there's value in that because that person is better alive than dead. So that that's and, and not capable of making those decisions. You're not capable at all. Yeah, right. Not, not yeah. capable at all. They ju- right. they just can't stop. Right. And, and and there's a process, right? You're gonna have a clinical. You're gonna have a clinician assess that person. Typically in typical in a court, in a court setting, in kind of one of the back, one of the one of the jail cells, to be very candid. Um, and they'll have a back and forth. A lot of times, the person will have an attorney to make the case. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of times with these Section 35s in particular. You'll have the individual themselves say, yeah, I want to go. I want to go. And that's, to me, that's just a, a beautiful thing. It's like a, a realization that for whatever, whether it's, whether it's an act of God, whether it's an act of fill in the blanks, that person realizes, I'm going to die. I, I should go. I should go. I should go. I should submit to this, to this Section 35. I, I, I think that maybe that is one moment of – that's that submission where somebody says, you know, almost like it's a relief. It's the time. Somebody else is asking me or telling me or confronts me with it, and it's, it must be in some way. You know what? I don't have to do this on my own. Maybe being forced to do it is almost a relief to say it's the time and okay, and they submit to it. Uh, versus I would think that you'd get in the opposite. Some people will say, you know, even when you have, for, for example, um, an intervention, and we had one with my aunt many, many years ago, and she resisted it and dismissed it and said, we were all nuts. And I suppose you get that reaction quite a bit. Oh, that's I, I, myself. It was, <laughs> I, I, gave that, I gave that response. Um, I don't have to look any further. Um, yeah. You know, when we – it's just such a – it's a, you know, and I don't think a lot of people understand this, that – when people are kind of in those throes of addiction, they are, and this is this is just from from talking to them, right? They're not happy with what they're doing. They, you know, they'll describe a situation where I've heard a lot of people say this. You know, where someone will say, you know, I enjoyed my first high with heroin, and I've been chasing it and miserable ever since. You know, whether they're doing it to not get sick again, whether they're doing it for 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 whatever reason, but they're not enjoying it. They don't. They don't like living under a bridge. They don't like waking up in the morning and, and the only thing on their mind is how do they get high. That, that No one will sit here. No, you're not going to have a guest. I defy you to tell me that you'd ever have a guest, someone who's in, re, someone who's in the throes of addiction who's going to come on here and say, you know, I'm addicted to heroin and I absolutely love it. Best decision I ever made. There's not a single person I've spoken with that it will ever say that. And, and if yeah. you ever do, I, I want to come back here and talk to that person because that just a that just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so they know that they're living this life of misery. It's how do we as a society help them get out of it? Yeah, and although they're not happy, they're unable to change. Yeah, and sometimes it's where you, other people have to come in to just bring them out. Uh, and sometimes it's not just to get high. It's to relieve pain. Oh. Uh, and sometimes it's just the dope sickness that they want to relieve. And so that cycle just perpetuates over and over. Absolutely. You can't get away. If you look at, if you kind of look at the, the way that it's been explained to me, and it's been articulated a lot better than I could in a lot of books, is there's kind of been three phases of this, you know, this opiate pandemic, if you will. You know, the first phase was really, you know, we've, we've seen about this with, you know, the prescription drugs. Prescription drugs, a, a typical scenario that we've all heard, all heard countless times is, you know, person goes in, they, they, they broke their leg, yeah. um, given a prescription for oxys. Pro- a lot of times far more than they needed and a refilled where someone was just way too willing to do that. Um, at some point in time, they just can't afford that anymore. Doctor cuts them off. They get it on the black market. Those pills are too expensive. They then turn to heroin. They turn to heroin. That's a um, common story. Common story. Yeah. Common story. So, so if you look at the prescription pill epidemic, we kind of break it up into three. Mm-hmm. It was first, and and obviously, and I would be remiss if I didn't take a shot at them for their hands in this kind of the Purdue Pharma, the Sackler family. Um, you know, that that's just a whole other thing. So, uh, the pharmaceutical drug uh, 
prescription drug epidemic that we had, then a heroin epidemic. And if you talk to a lot of people right now, we're kind of in the throes of a, of a fentanyl pan- pandemic yeah. right now. Um, it's not, you know, you can talk to someone, and I frequently do this. It's, it's, it's almost, you'll, you'll talk to some people where getting heroin is a challenge right now. It's all fentanyl. It's all fentanyl right now. Um, and that presents, because obviously for those that don't know what fentanyl is, it is incredibly more potent and stronger than heroin. So every time you do it, there, there's a... I mean, I, I don't... It's mind. Russian roulette. Yeah, it's absolutely. What it, yeah. That's a great way to put it. It's yeah. Russian roulette. Yeah. And the thing you mentioned, too, is access. And uh, I have <clears throat> grandchildren, uh, 16, 14, 11, and 2. I worry about them. Of course. The access to heroin, fentanyl in high school. And I've talked to several people, families, and how hard it would be to... Uh, a couple of texts, social media, I can have it within an hour. That's frightening. It's, it's it is it well as as, as it, some what you just mentioned your grandchildren as someone yeah. who's a few months away from having his first child. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm petrified about that. Um, particularly with a dad who has these inclinations, if you will, these proclivities, if you will, someone who's in recovery. Um, the access that that's a whole nother. You know, th- there's a um, I just can't say enough good things about the men and women of because look this is a this is a supply and a demand side of it right there there's 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 the there's the folks that are disseminating this poison killing people and then there's obviously the demand side um and our efforts need to be both and i've heard you know we will frequently talk about the war on drugs and there's been books written by a lot of people a lot smarter than me on that but what I will tell you is that the, the, the men and women of, you know, who, who, whose job in law enforcement is to kind of go after and target folks who are disseminating this poison, um, I can't say enough good things about them. And I, and, and I want to be very clear here, just so, so a viewer or even you two don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. I believe that folks in the, in, in the throes of addiction who are dealing with this. It's just a, it, this, this is a public health issue, right? I, I am absolutely in the camp of this is not a criminal justice thing. I mean, what, what do you, what, there is no value in, in, in sending someone who is addicted to heroin to prison or to jail. There, there's, 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 from, a, from a taxpayer standpoint, from a getting this person better standpoint, from a fill in the blanks, there's no value to it. And, and you can make a, a very conservative argument and a very liberal argument why that's the case. Um, however, the individuals who are doing nothing but profiting off and disseminating this death, um, I don't even know if I can say this, but my view is that there's a special place for hell in them, mm. for them. Um, I apologize if that word It's like mass been. murder, right? It's, to well, put, it's, just, it's, 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 it's just terrible. Oh. And, and they're exploiting, I watched a, a show on Netflix the other night called The Social Dilemma. Have you seen that? Yes. Re- w- w- I have seen it, but what is it? Re- Social media, memory. the addiction to ah. the phones and the clicking and the uh, how they trap you. and um, It it was eye-opening. Yeah. In fact, when I got done watching, I shut off all my <laughs> stuff. But one of the things that made me think about that is we talked about uh, – self-esteem and teens and the the adolescence insecurities and things like that and one of the things they said was um especially with teen girls the the therapy the need for therapy has just spiked up over the last few years teen suicides have gone up in the last few years the other thing that they've said was there is a lack of interest in it used to be years when we were younger get your license as soon as you can Mm -hmm. get out there play sports get out and be active and see your friends face to face now covid certainly um, nobody's fault nobody could see each other personally this way but they said even before the the lack of face-to-face and interaction sports getting your license getting out there and the the teen particularly the the teen girls 13 to, to 17 how drawn they are to this and how it affects their self-esteem because they're either bullied online and what happens then they're they start to think differently they get self-conscious they get um and may be drawn to to self-medicate 
so well yes 100 percent everything yeah. you just said so what I, I look back at at my childhood then it was okay you have school and things happen in school um it could be let's just say you know i'll just talk about me i had, I had, a, I had a real big crush on a girl at, at westfield high school um and I remember I had made a decision. This is the day I'm going to go talk to her. I had planned out in my mind, I'm going to walk down this hallway. I'm going to see her. I'm going to bump into her. And I painted like this Romeo and Juliet scenario in my mind. Yeah. And it was on that day in particular, it was like I had I had more pimples on my face than I wanted to. And so I so I didn't do it. And someone had said something like, hey, uh, hey, Vilas, nice zit on your face, something like that. Okay. I go home for the day. I go play basketball. I go fight with my friends. We go play basketball. We take it on the basketball court. And that trauma, as perceived in my mind, typically ended there. Or one of my buddies might say something. Now imagine a young man or a young woman going through that today. Or, or anything like that. Not it's that enhanced my thing. now. It's, 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 it's yeah. enhanced. It's exacerbated. Yep. It's, it's, it's amplified on social media. And it's what, what young kids have to go through today because of social media. It is abs- – I can't even begin to contemplate it because it's just there's – no, there's no stopping it right now. As human beings, we need to be able to turn it off and get right with ourselves. And there's just – one of the things that I've come to see in the other committee, um, the, the, the children and families, is um, to your point, you know, mental health illness – for, for, for young kids has absolutely skyrocketed. Yes. And it's from, you know, being out of schools. It's from social media. You know, we are, it's just not the same what kids are going through today than, than in my day, in your day, right. anything. And I, and I, and I social media is a, is, a, is a big part of that. But you, you said something interesting, and I'm reading a book right now, and I'm forgetting the book that I'm reading right now, but it's by Judd Brewer, and he was talking about Essentially, he was talking about all the addictive mind. I, forget, I read a lot of addiction books, and Judd Brewer is a real leader in the school of thought. He's at Brown University. He's a big meditation guy, but he was talking about social media, and he was saying how you know he realized this was a problem when he was in Paris, and he was at one of the museums, and he 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 was looking at this couple in front of them, and here they are at this world-renowned museum in Paris, and and they were occasionally looking at the museum but mostly taking photos posting it on social media and looking at talk he could hear him talking about how many likes and how many comments they got and, and they're having these conversations as they're missing the museum they're walking by not taking the museum in and and, and he kind of proposed uh he goes you know what we should do we should do a, we should we should propose a policy where social media is okay, but once you post something, you can't go back to it to see if people have liked it or have made comments. And that his hypothesis was, was that just like someone who's in the throes of addiction with alcohol or heroin, whatever, that like and that comment is a dopamine kick for that yes. person, and yeah. it's kicking up their dopamine. And it's and the opposite effect is if it's not if happening. It's, exactly, exactly. <laughs> if, if if nobody's liking it, or or God forbid, which happens so many times, yeah. particularly with with stu- young kids, is that someone might say something that, hey, that's an ugly dress, or hey, that's an ugly shirt. Well, that that one comment is going to mess up that kid's world in a way that the three people in this room right now never had to consider. Um, and, and I firmly believe we need to do everything we can to, to, to push back on that because, you know, I, again, I just referenced, I don't, I don't have kids yet. I've got my first kid expecting in, in January. I'm expecting in January. But I remember my sister. My, my sister lives in California, and I've got two nephews, Tyler and Hudson. And I remember talking to my sister, Jen. She's like, John, I've never seen my boys like this. Hmm. To, and it was, it was COVID. And again, it, so these issues were brewing before COVID. Right. But COVID has just completely exacerbated all of them. And she said, my two boys who all they wanted to do, all they want to do is go out and play baseball, play football and everything like that. Um, something is going on. And it's, we really need to pause in a soci- as a society when, when we have our children. Because to your point, you know, at some point in time, they, they the, these kids want to, kids adults everybody we're talking about kids though want to get out of themselves and too often than not to stop 
whatever they're seeing on those god-awful social media devices, they decide, hey, I'm going to self-medicate. Yes. I want to get out of my mind right now. I can't believe Johnny or Sarah made fun of my dress or or I was bullied today. I need, I'm going to take this pill because I know if I take this pill, um, I'm not going to feel like that. It's going to stop in my mind. Um, and that's and, and, and with, you know, hopefully the plan is that these kids are going to be our adults. These are going to be our leaders. These are going to be our fellow human beings, right? Is there any more justification we need than they're just our fellow human beings? But it's, it's you know, the, the, the impact of social media on society today is, is you know, that's, that's 15 segments you should have on You're that. Right. <laughs> You're right. Um, well, speaking of, of, uh, of, of that, I, I, I know we're starting to run out of time. Um, but before we go, um, what have you got coming up next? Any, uh, I know you got a, a show coming up that you're working on. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a show. I'm debuting a show here. I, we'll be right here in this room, right? Uh, Westfield. Westfield. Yeah. Well, there you go. There you go. That, that's my. I better study up on my show. <laughs> don't show up here. Yeah, don't show me to show up here for my show in Westfield. Um, that someday we'll be back here. With, um, yeah. So that that's great. So so I I've got a show coming up too. In my whole in my experience. I do, I do a column in the Westfield paper. Yep. And one of the things that I get from the people of Westfield is that we love, we love knowing what's going on in Beacon Hill. I firmly believe that one of the reasons that people in my line of work are just vehemently despised is because people get elected and then they no longer communicate with their constituents. Letting them know what they're doing, letting them know what we are doing on Beacon Hill is keeping them in the process. This show is about bringing various people on myself to tell them what's going on in their state government. Yeah, and one of the things I appreciate about you, John, is that uh, I see your updates um, weekly uh, yeah. uh, through social media. Yeah. Sorry to admit it's on social media. <laughs> Don't, I want to be very clear here. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good from social media, too. I know. I, so yeah, I, probably is, should have yeah. been a little more clear. It's, it's the we've gone overboard. I agree. Social media has connected us right. in a way right. that, you know, I, I've connected with friends from – when I was nine and ten years old, there's good, yeah. but we've gone overboard. But that that's a way that to get that that uh, update, right? Yeah. That you provide, which is great, and it's fantastic mm-hmm. to do that. Uh, so we look forward to that show, and uh, also too getting updates from your uh, opiate committee. Um, love to hear that, and also have you back. I mean, I think you're right. We could talk for hours. We we're gonna yeah. have a very busy fall into yeah. winter in the Mass Senate where we plan on taking up a, a a mental illness bill, a mental health bill, as well as a substance use disorder bill, and, and basically all of the the leaders in, in these areas right now. And make no mistake about it, there are there are many. I am one fortunate enough to be joined by really several amazing colleagues, and we're gonna try to come up with a you know a good piece of legislation that you know hopefully at the end of the day can help some people. That's great. That's great. Uh, well, thanks again for, for joining us. Appreciate it, man. Sure, absolutely. Anytime. Uh, thanks. And thanks for what you do. Sure. Oh, by the, yeah. can I just say one thing before yeah. we go? I, yeah. I just, you know, you asked me what books I'm currently reading in your book I have read. So that's that's past tense, um, Voices from the Fallen. And I, and I want to say this. More people need to give a, we need to hear. One of the great things about that book is that it talks about not just the, it gives the real world clinicians viewpoints about the individuals suffering from their addition yeah. in real time right. um, which for someone like me allows me to process it in my mind but a lot of times the people that are left out of these conversations in terms of recovery in terms of substance use disorders are the people who are in recovery themselves yeah. you know nobody knows recovery better than people in, in recovery, recovery. Um, right. and your book does a great job capturing that so I just want to say that thank you very much much for, for mentioning Absolutely. that um, and also um, as a reminder in honor of the veterans that we've lost again if you'd like to donate to the Springfield Vet Center uh, va.gov look for the Springfield Vet Center it's located in West Springfield and uh, if you'd like to make a donation it's very much appreciated Thank you all for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks.